Morning, all you strange people. Uh, I hope you recognize that strangeness is a good thing and that when I call you strange, it's a compliment. I like you and I like strange people, so it goes well together. We're continuing this series. Uh, we're going to be in First Peter uh, chapters 3 and 4 today, so if you want to get that queued up, we're going to be right in uh, those two chapters. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a guy in Kentucky named Bobby McDonald. He lives in Walton, Kentucky, and he's a member of the city council. And uh, he was up for re-election, and he had a, a strong opponent, so he did a lot of campaigning. It was really important to him to have this, this role. He felt like he was making a difference in his community. Um, so uh, the night before the election, his wife worked her first shift as a student nurse, 12-hour shift. So the next morning, she didn't wake up to her alarm, and he thought, you know what, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to let her sleep in. And so he didn't wake her up. And he went on to work. Um, she slept way late uh, and ended up being late for class. She was going to school that day. She ended up being late for class. And she did not get a chance to vote. And it, it was election day. And the election results came in that night. And it was a tie. 670 votes each between him and his opponent. So they flipped a coin. And he lost. <laughs> and he thought... Ah, I lit, you know, he let his wife sleep in, and the assumption is she would have voted for him, and he would have won the election if he had just been mean and woken her up, you know. But you try to do something nice, and it backfires. You ever had that happen? You ever heard that phrase, no good deed goes unpunished? Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? And we scratch our heads, and we go, why does the world have to be this way? Why can't we just live in a world where if you put good things into it, you get good things out of it? Isn't that kind of what we teach our kids? We kind of say, hey, look, if you be honest and you be kind and respectful, people will be honest and kind and respectful to you. Is that really true? No, it's actually not true. You can be honest and kind and respectful, and people will take advantage of your honesty and your kindness for their own gain. That's not how the world works. It's not really a fair system. And, and it creates a lot of tension in us. Like, what is the point of trying to be kind if, if it's just going to backfire? It's going to cost me. Because we want to apply this perspective. When you do good, you get good in return. We want to apply that to the world, and it just doesn't work. We also want to apply it in our, in our faith. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's really easy and tempting to think, if I give up everything to put Jesus at the center of my life, then I'm going to have a good life. God, God's going to make sure that I'm, I'm well taken care of. I'm, I'll never have to worry about money. I'll never have to worry about sickness. I'll never have to worry about, you know, broken relationships because I've put Jesus at the center of my life. But is that how Christianity works? When you choose to put Jesus at the center, does it mean you never have to struggle with money, that you never see sickness in, in your family or broken relationships? No, that's not how that works. And, and I think this is what Peter is addressing in this letter. He's writing to these believers in uh, the Greek and Roman provinces, and he's saying, because you have chosen to follow Jesus, there will be some difficult things that are going to come into your life. You, you might be persecuted actively by the people around you. Your neighbors, your coworkers may actually make life harder for you because of your choice to follow Jesus. So how are you supposed to live? How are we supposed to gain a perspective on pain and suffering that allows us to continue to love and trust God when things don't go our way? How do we do that? Well, first, I want to help us um, understand what our perspective normally is, what kind of is normal for human beings and human nature. So I need you to uh, participate with me for a minute. You should have a piece of paper. Hopefully, you got a bulletin. If you didn't, um, find some paper around, like steal it from somebody else or whatever you need to do to get some paper. And there should be pens uh, in the seat back in front of you. So grab paper and a pen, and I'm going to have you do an exercise that will help us maybe understand um, kind of where we are and where we need to go from here. First thing I want you to do on your paper is draw a circle about the size of a dime. Would you do that, please? Kind of in the middle. A circle just about the size of a dime. When we experience pain and loss and suffering, it's like our vision zooms in really close to this one thing. And suddenly, our whole world is wrapped up in this pain and suffering, this loss, this thing that hurts. And, and, and we, we kind of were focused on this thing. Inside your circle, I want you to draw a square, a pretty big one, one that takes up most of your, your circle. That square represents your pain, the, 
the negative thing that happened, the thing that didn't go like you wanted it to go, you didn't get the promotion, you got a bad diagnosis, this relationship um, is, is on the rocks or it's broken. This is, the, this is the difficult thing. And we zoom in and suddenly this pain seems to be like all we can see, all we can think about. And in those moments, we begin to be susceptible to some untruths that I think are just human nature. They're part of the way that we typically see the world and, and the way the world kind of works is we begin to think, first of all, we begin to think, I have to solve this. Like, this is my problem to solve. There's pain in my life. I got to get it out. That's, that sounds logical, right? But if you look back at your pain in the past, how many times were you able to solve that pain? You were able just to come up with a brilliant solution and you were able to just re- eliminate that pain from your life. Does that, is that how it normally works? No. Normally, it's not a problem that we can just solve. And let me tell you, as a, as a male of the species, that drives me a little nuts because everything should be solvable, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we do. I, I solve problems. You bring me your problem and I solve it. I have my own problems, I solve them. But our pain sometimes is something that we just can't solve. And we, but we buy into this lie that I have to solve this. And we begin to take responsibility on ourselves to do this. And we just keep beating our head against the wall. The second lie I think that we begin to believe is that God doesn't care. If God really cared about me, would, would this be happening? If God really cared about me, wouldn't he just take this out of my life? Wouldn't he fix this? W- wouldn't he make sure I have enough money? Wouldn't he heal this relationship? Wouldn't he get this toxic person out of my life? If God really cared about me, wouldn't God solve this problem? And we begin to have doubts about how much he really loves us and how much he's really paying attention. That's, that's not true either. And the, the third thing that I think we begin to believe is that I'm, I'm not going to make it. There's no way out. Maybe you've said that kind of thing. Somebody, I just don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't think I'm going to make it. I, I don't know what that looks like for you, how that plays out in your head, but I think that's something we begin to feel we struggle with is when we, we can't solve it and we don't, we're not sure God really is paying attention. And I, I start to wonder, how am I going to make it? And what Peter is, is going to encourage these believers to do is to gain a different perspective. And so part of what we need to do is, is notice that we have zoomed in on this and then we need to zoom out. So I want you to draw another circle. I want you to draw a big one about the size of an oatmeal cream pie. You guys know what that is? I hope so. Heavens to Betsy. If you don't know what that is, we, we need to take a trip down south. Um, so draw a big circle, oatmeal cream, cream pie size. And um, notice something. The size of your square doesn't change, right? But doesn't it look smaller? It's, it's taking up less of your circle. And so if we're able to zoom out and recognize that our life is not the sum total of this moment of pain, that there's more to our lives... Than, than what we're experiencing in this moment, then maybe we can see that our pain, it's real, and it still hurts, but it's not everything. It's not all-consuming. It's not the only thing that matters in my life. And maybe we can begin to see that there are some good things. So I want you to draw some stars in your circle. Your stars are going to represent the positive things, the good things that God has brought into your life. This is a practice for Thursday when Maybe, maybe one of your traditions, you go around and everybody says what they're thankful for. So what are some things that you're thankful for? And for each one you can think of, draw a star inside your circle. All right, see how many stars you can end up with. When we zoom in on our pain, it, it blinds us to the good things that God has brought into our lives. But if we can take a step back and we can remember, we have so much to be thankful for. We have so many blessings in our lives that God has just poured out on us because he loves us. It begins to change our perspective a little bit. And then I I want you to draw a circle that sort of intersects your circle a little bit. I'll show you what that looks like. Just draw a circle that kind of overlaps, intersects. This circle represents somebody else's life. And when when we are zoomed into our own problem, we can't can't think about other people. and, And whatever you got going on, sorry, I ain't got time for you. I got my own thing I'm working on. But if we can zoom out and we can start to get a bigger picture of our lives and what's going on in the world around us, we begin to see that our pain maybe intersects with somebody else's pain. And even though the pain itself is not a good thing, that connection is a very good thing. In fact, that connection, that being able to recognize that we have a common experience in this thing that's hurting us, 
That connection is part of what gets us through. That's why God set the church up the way he did. Because it brings us together. It causes us to form these connections so that if you have pain in your life and I have pain in my life, then we, we get to kind of share something there where we can help each other and move together forward. If we can zoom out. So this is what Peter is going to try to get us to do. As we go through these few verses, I, I just want you to remember and kind of keep your eyes on these circles that what he's trying to get us to do is to zoom out, not to ignore our pain, not to pretend like it doesn't exist, but to zoom out our perspective a little bit and start to see that there's more to our lives than, than this thing that hurts. And what else is there that I'm missing? Okay, you ready? First Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Let's start there. Where is it? Oh, here we go. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Peter says that there may be pain and suffering that comes into your life because you have chosen to follow Jesus. Now, not all pain is a result of choosing to follow Jesus. Sometimes pain and suffering is a consequence of a bad decision that you made, right? You, maybe you drove too fast on the highway and you got caught and you got pulled over and you get a ticket and you have to pay a fine, right? And uh, that's not because you chose to follow Jesus. That's not you know, anybody's fault but yours. You just made a choice, now you're paying the consequences. Sometimes uh, pain is just a harsh reality of the fallen world that we live in because there, there exists sin and death and sickness and hardship and evil in the world. Sometimes bad things just happen and it's not anybody's fault. It's just, it, it, there's, who, who do we blame for cancer? It's just a harsh reality of a fallen world. But sometimes Peter would say that there's, there's going to be pain in your life, suffering in your life, that's a result of your choice to try to live out the gospel in a worldly culture. And he says, when that pain comes, you will be blessed. You'll be blessed. He says, don't, don't be afraid. You're blessed. And so if we can zoom out from our pain for a moment... Peter says, we, have this, we can have this perspective that I'm not afraid of the pain that, that can come into my life or what I'm experiencing right now. I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm blessed. Now, that's, that's a strange perspective. You don't see that a lot. You don't hear that a lot. That's not what you expect to hear from someone when they're going through a hard time. I'm not afraid of this. I'm blessed by it. But he says, when we see that God is at work in ways that we don't understand, we're able to acknowledge that God, what he wants for us is to bring us a blessing through our pain. I'm not afraid I'm blessed. Um, in verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, let's take a look at that. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. He said, there, there's going to be trials, there's going to be pain, there's going to be suffering, don't be surprised. This isn't strange. This is normal. It's normal for bad things to happen. Don't be surprised. He continues. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but it'll let him glorify God in that name. It's interesting the way he talks about if you, if you suffer under the name Christian. When the, the word Christian was uh, first being used, it wasn't being used by the Christians. They didn't call themselves Christians. They were, they were disciples of Jesus. They were, or maybe they called themselves followers of the way, the way of Jesus. It was non-Christians that came up with the name Christian, and it wasn't a compliment. It was intended to be derogatory. It was an insult to be called a Christian. It was, it was kind of like a sign that you're, you're foolish and you, you, you're kind of out of touch with reality. Maybe you're not very smart, like you're a Christian. And so Peter says, even if someone calls you a Christian, wear that name with pride. That sounds strange to us. We're like, well, of course I wear it with pride. Jesus is my Savior. I, I'm a follower of Christ. I, I love the name Christian. But it wasn't intended to be that way at the beginning. 
And the Christians kind of adopted that insult and they made it a badge of honor. And so now Peter would say to us, if, if there's something that comes upon you, because maybe somebody says, you're just too religious. Anybody ever said that to you? Or thought, you, you know, you're just, why are you, you're just too religious. You take this to an extreme. You're like a Jesus freak. When I was uh, in, in high school and college, that was the term Jesus freak, you know, that you would use for people that just took it a little too far, you know, you're taking it a little too far. And he would, Peter would say, if you, if you suffer for being somebody who's fully sold out to Jesus, he said, that's, that's not a bad thing. That's a, that's a good thing. You, that, that honors God. Just take, take pride in that. So he says, don't be surprised when pain and suffering come upon you, but be joyful. Don't be surprised, be joyful. What he's encouraging us to do is look beyond the pain of now. Look beyond the pain of right now. There is more going on in your life. There's more going on in the world. There's, God is up to more than just this thing that, that hurts. There's more happening. And if we can open our eyes up to that, we don't have to be surprised. We don't have to be afraid. We know that we're blessed, and we can actually be joyful. James uh, says in James chapter 1, he says, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. We're supposed to consider it joy because it's an opportunity for God to do something through us that can make a difference to other people. What does that look like? Let's move on. So the, the strange attitude to suffering is that we're not afraid, we're blessed, we're not surprised, we're joyful. So what is our response? Chapter 4, verse 7, Peter says this, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, he says the end of all things is at hand. He, he's not talking about the end of the world because the end of the world didn't happen shortly after he wrote this letter. It's been a couple thousand years and the end of the world still hasn't happened. I think what Peter is saying is the end of all things, the, the end of your pain, there is an end time to this. Your pain is not going to go on forever. This, there's going to be a point at which this no longer hurts. You're gonna, it's going to be replaced with just joy at being in the presence of Christ. There is an end to your pain. It's not going to last forever. So, in the meantime, he says, be self-controlled, sober-minded. He's saying, don't let your pain push you into a bad decision. How many of you ever had that happen? You got emotional because you were hurt, you were damaged, words came out of your mouth that you wish you had never said, and you cannot take them back, right? Or you make a decision because one of the things that makes you feel better is to spend money, and so you go and spend a lot of money, and you felt better for a second, and then you look back and you go, what did I do? <laughs> I've made a huge mistake, right? He says, don't, don't let your pain push you into bad decisions. Be sober-minded. The opposite of that would be drunk-minded. Are, are drunk people known for good decision-making? No, that's why we kind of have laws to protect us from ourselves when it comes to those kind of things. Be sober-minded. Don't let your pain push you into a bad decision. This is a strange response. It means that we're going to look ahead. We're going we're to have a plan for when we get hurt, how we're going to live our lives. Maybe you're not experiencing pain and suffering right now. And if so, that's great. I'm really happy for you. I'm glad that you're at a place of peace. But we know the reality of the world we live in, that if it's not happening now, it's probably coming in the future. I don't, I'm not trying to be morbid, but that's just how life works, right? So what is your plan? How are you going to handle the pain that may be down the road for you? Here's what Peter would say, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. He said, I want you to think like Jesus thinks, okay? For whoever has suffered in the flesh is ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. He said, Jesus' mind was set on God's will and what was going to come as a result of him being obedient to God. So I want you to think the same way. Zoom out. What is the big picture here? The big picture is my faithfulness to God. And where does that lead me? And in chapter 3, we see that where it led Jesus was to being seated at the right hand of God with the angels and authorities under his feet. That's where it led Jesus. And he knew that. He knew that was coming. And you know what's coming for you because God has promised you. There's coming a time when there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more sorrow. Do you believe that? 
That promise is true and it's out there and you know what's coming. And, and Peter says, set your mind on that. Look ahead and see what God has in store for you. Trust in his promise that that's coming. So now you can have a plan. When I experience pain, I'm not going to be shocked. I'm not going to be surprised. I'm not going to let it push me into bad decisions. Paul wrote it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Paul said, yeah, it hurts right now, but it is nothing compared to the good that's coming. It is nothing compared to being in the presence of God in eternity. It's nothing compared to that. So our strange response to suffering starts with looking ahead and believing God's promise. Next, in 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10, here's what he says. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So a lot of one another's in this passage. Peter is writing to people who are being persecuted for their faith, and he says, in the midst of your pain, your persecution, your suffering, I want you to look outward. Focus outward. Think about other people. Love one another. Show hospitality to one another. Serve one another. That feels a little counterintuitive. Like, how am I going to solve my problem if I'm also trying to deal with your problem? Well, maybe, maybe the way that my pain gets addressed is by me taking my eyes off of it long enough to serve you. And then somebody else will come along and be a blessing to me. Maybe. That's, that's why God created the community of believers the way he did, because we need each other. So he says, maybe you can take your mind off yourself and think about others. This doesn't mean that we ignore our pain, that we act like it doesn't exist. We did some work on emotional health last summer, and this is one of the things we talked about. We've got to, we've got to sit with our pain long enough to understand where it's coming from, and we, we've got to embrace the fact that it's real and, and that our emotions are, are a part of who we are. But if we just stay zoomed in on that, what we're missing is this other circle of connection we have with the people around us. So Peter says, zoom out, focus on other people, be a blessing to other people, even in your pain. And maybe you can help somebody else deal with something difficult in their lives. Uh, My brother, when he was uh, a teenager, was helping my dad uh, build his house. And as a teenage boy, my brother's main interest in this construction project was the power tools, and the different things you can do with power tools that are not exactly what they were designed for. So uh, he got a hold of the nail gun. It was a giant. It was a big. It wasn't one of those little trim nailers. It was a huge nail gun. And uh, he thought, this looks like fun. And so he grabbed a piece of uh, OSB and leaned it up against his leg, and he was going to see if he could shoot a nail all the way through the OSB, right? You guys all see where this is going. But when you're 17, like, there's no consequences for anything. You just do whatever comes to mind. So he shoots a nail through the OSB. It goes straight into his foot, buries itself into his left foot. And so they, they, they go to the hospital, to the ER, and um, my dad the whole time is going, just let me take it out with pliers. I can just, just let me get my pliers. And my brother's like, don't touch me with your pliers. They get to the ER, and the emergency room doctor says, Hang on just a second. He goes out to his truck, gets a pair of pliers, and comes back in (laughs) and takes the nail out with his pliers. My dad was like, I could have done that. So my sisters were waiting for them when they came home from the hospital, and they're just just geniuses at stuff like this. So they, they were waiting for my brother when he came home with this really embarrassing and painful injury with a cookie cake in the shape of a foot with a giant nail in it. I... It's a story we still tell. We tell every time we get together because we have so much fun with it, and uh, my brother's a good, good sport about it. So in our family, the term nailed it means something totally different. Uh, <laughs> we have a good time with that. But it's an opportunity, even in your moment of pain, to look at somebody else and say, how can I, how can I bless somebody else? How can I be an encouragement? Maybe even bring a little humor into somebody's life. Give them a reason to smile or laugh. But if we stay focused and zoomed in on our own pain, we miss out on chances to bless other people. So focus outward. Uh, And finally, we're going to end with this, 1 Peter 3.15. He says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. 
Peter says, in the midst of your pain and suffering, if you have this strange perspective, if you are not afraid but blessed, if you are not surprised but joyful, if you are looking for ways to serve others in the middle of your pain, people are going to wonder about you. They're, they're going to look at you and go, that's, that's strange. Why are, you, why are you joyful? Why are you serving others? You should be miserable. And when they ask, you have an opportunity to point them to your hope. What is your hope? Hope is the word we use to describe the bridge between what God has done in the past and what he has promised to do in the future. So, is it true that God has done good things for you in the past? Is that true? Yes. yes. So you have this pillar. Is it true that God has promised good things for your future? Yes. When we're in the middle of pain, we're caught between these two things and we cannot see what God is doing in the moment. And hope is the word for that bridge between what God has done in the past and the confidence that he's got good things in our future. And hope has a name, and it is Jesus. Peter says, in the middle of your suffering, you're going to suffer in a way that is so strange to the people around you that they're going to say, what is wrong with you? And you get to say, listen, God has done good things in my past. He has made promises about my future. And right now, I'm just holding on to Jesus. That's all I got. And when we do this, we get to open a door wide for people who don't know Christ to take another look, to see Jesus in a different way than maybe they've ever seen him before. I think a lot of people, we are, listen, we are surrounded by people. We know that in northern Hamilton County, there's about 11 or 12,000 people, and half of them do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 5,000, almost 6,000 people in our community don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Why? Because for a lot of people, they've written him off as irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. I don't need that. When they get to see how you deal with pain and suffering because you're able to hold on to Jesus, you're able to know that you're blessed, that you have joy, you're able to serve others in the midst of your pain, it causes people to take another look at Jesus and say, maybe, maybe there's something more. Maybe I missed something about who Jesus is and what he means in my life. And that's the mission, ladies and gentlemen. Go into all the world and make disciples. When we show and tell the gospel in the way that we live our lives, other people see Christ in a new way. I don't know what your pain is. I don't know what your suffering is. But if it leads someone else into a relationship with Jesus Christ, is it worth it? It's an opportunity. It's a wide open door. Be strange. When you're hurting, know you're blessed. Rejoice. Serve others and point to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this challenging and encouraging truth from your word that we, we're going to experience pain and suffering even though you love us, even though you care deeply about us, even though you're involved daily in our lives, there's still going to be pain and suffering. And I pray, Father, that we would gain a perspective that you can use that to point somebody else to Jesus. You can use that to be an encouragement to others who are hurting. God, I pray that you give us a new perspective on our pain, one that includes the truth of your word and a heart for others. God, may you use us, may you be active in our lives in such a way that people see Christ in us. And may you get the glory for every life that is changed. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.